Vice Chancellor, fellow council members and staff of the university, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. It is customary for the university and its guests to gather as a body for the purpose of conferring academic awards on its graduates. This morning, we have gathered in order that awards may be conferred on those who have satisfied the council of the university that they have met the requirements for admission to the awards undertaken within the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. <clears throat> to members of a university, a ceremony for the conferring of awards is a particularly important and happy occasion in the university year. To all of you, I extend a warm welcome. To graduates and diplomats, I offer congratulations and best wishes. The mission of the university is, in part, to provide a wide range of teaching, research, scholarship, and service at the highest level of excellence and consistent with its aim of maintaining national and international esteem. The university has a commitment to the advancement and transmission of knowledge by the pursuit, recognition, and the achievement of excellence in scholarship, research, and teaching. This will be evidenced in the course of today's ceremony. Education today is about the acquisition of lifelong learning skills. I believe that the awards to be conferred upon our graduates and diplomats today will qualify them to make significant contributions in the local, national, and in the case of some, the international community. Lastly, I take this opportunity to remind those receiving their test aimers today that as graduates and diplomats of the university, you automatically become members of convocation. Thus, you join 40,000 other graduates and have an opportunity through elected representatives to become involved in the governance of the university. Through convocation, you will also be kept informed of activities and developments at the university. By the authority conferred upon me by the council, I will now formally confer academic awards. Will all candidates for admission to degrees and other awards please stand? <coughs> In the name of the Council and by my authority as Chancellor, I confer the award specified in the program on all those graduates and diplomats who are present today and in absentia on those unable to be present. I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science to present graduates and graduate diplomats from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of Associate Diploma in Occupational Health and Safety. Garth Lawson Anderson. Brian Vincent Clark. <laughs> Michael James Dahl. <laughs> Lee Ann Gleason. John Arthur Harris. <laughs> Beverly Christine Jackson. <laughs> Gregory Keyes. Peter John Kilpatrick. <laughs> Ben.
David Lyons. <laughs> Kenneth James Raymond. <laughs> Adrian Luke Reynolds. Peter John Ross Riley. Andrew Peter Russell. Kenneth Donald Wicks. Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of Diploma in Applied Science, Medical Radiation Technology in the Specialization of Nuclear Medicine. Michelle Louise Baker. <laughs> Nicole Gay Barnes. Simon Paul Melmoth. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of Diploma in Applied Science, Medical Radiation Technology, in the specialization of Diagnostic Radiography. Matthew David Collins. Philip Anthony Garrahy. <laughs> Michael James Halverson. <laughs> Alina Tracy Hargens. Mark Donald Southern. Craig Anthony Vandenberg. Brooke Lee Phoebe. Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of the Diploma in Occupational Health and Safety, Darrell Stephen Boyce. <laughs> Alan Jeffrey Brumham. Donald James Burns. <laughs> Kenneth Kamlesh Kumar. <laughs> Alan Lewis Tompkins. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Applied Science in the Specialization of Consumer Science, Donna Joy Black. <laughs> Donna Louise Carr. Ilona Sandra Christian. <laughs> Sh
Sharon Linnell Crouch. <laughs> Natalie Hughes. <laughs> Samantha Irving. Diane Francis Lindsay. <laughs> Lindley Gail McCallum. <laughs> Matthew John McGuinness. Simone Patai. <laughs> Catherine Renner. <laughs> Emma Molly Gazina Reed. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Applied Science in the specialization of medical radiation technology, diagnostic radiography, Leanne Michelle Bambach. <laughs> Aliesha Karen Brislane. Kira Mayer Burke. <laughs> Melanie Peter Collum. <laughs> Christina Joy Kumba. Corey Doyle. <laughs> Stuart James Freer. <laughs> Alan John Gibson. Tania Louise Harrison. <laughs> Caroline Marmula. <laughs> Lyndall Leanne Maxwell. Brendan John McCall. <laughs> Michelle Ann McConnell. <laughs> Charmaine Therese McKeonan. Veronica Ann Nabar. <laughs> Catherine Lee Newton. <laughs> Ian Corwin Ka Kin Ng. Lisa Michelle Partridge.
David John Sloan. Jacqueline Maria Suri. Luisa Maria Spagnolo. Scott Lee Sullivan. Michael James Taylor. Pamela Vischer. Leanne Michelle Walter. Catherine Ann Wood. In radiation therapy, Rachel Marie Beldum. Cheryl Rose Botwood. Yolanda Espana. Nikki Heinrich. Matthew Robert Hoffman. Elena Kirstead Jones. Christy Lee Morin. Scott Andrew Piggott. Tony Ann Shields. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Health Science in the Specialization of Occupational Therapy with Honours Class 1, Karen Ann Height. <laughs> with Honours Class 1, Julie Ann Newman. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Medical Science with honors class two, division two, Claudia Madeline White. <laughs> with honors class two, division one, Scott Hilton Twadell. With honors, class one, Rebecca Louise Beers. With honors, class one, Wei Han Chua. With honors, class one, Diam Heng Lim. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Medicine, Simone Christine Allman.
Gillian Diane Bodie. Josephine Tessa Bernand. Chen Chong Ming. Adam Cooper. Duane Christopher Crabtree. Karen Elizabeth Cuthbert. Jody Michelle Ellis Clark. Kayleen Joy Ferguson. Fiona Jane Fleming. Karen Ann Greenleaves. Brenda Christine Hayworth. John David Holot. Nicola Ruth Holmes. Eva Alina Jankovic. Marianne Elizabeth Jauncey. Michelle Johnson. Kerry Ann Killingly. Denise Ladwick. Kathy Ann Lane. Leanne Jane Lout. <laughs> Naomi Francine Lee. <laughs> Martin Alexander Liedvogel. Aileen Conchi Lu. Christine Fiona McIntosh. Trina Sherelle McPherson. Kautna Matur. <laughs> Louise Alice McKinnon. <laughs> Z. 
Zenaida McTaggart. Joanne Lynette Morris. Michael Francis Murphy. Shivali Dinka Patel. Victoria Jane Pennington. Adrian Quinton Plaskett. Kirsten Barbara Pratt. Jatika Ruba. Alison Rutherford. Ivan Safranco. Andrea Selby. Susanna Everett Smart. Juliet Catherine Tate. <laughs> Therese Margaret Tubman. <laughs> Melissa Gay Van der Kuy. Janindra Herbert Waros Savitan. <laughs> Mark Wenetong. <laughs> With honours, Craig Leslie Barnett. Beth Lynette Churchill Bateman. <laughs> Jennifer Dan. <laughs> Stephen John Ferry. Rosemary K. Fenn. <laughs> Patricia Ellen Ferguson. <laughs> Jeanette Lorraine Hazeldean. Penelope Jane Hodges. <laughs> Donald Francis Innes. <laughs> Melissa Caroline Jennings. James 
Patrick McGurr. Elizabeth May Pepper. Andrew Robert Owen Phillips. Neil James Spratt. Vivian Linda Walsh. Lankangani Nayantara Wijaseni. <laughs> the University Medal is an award made in recognition of academic excellence. It is a rare honor and may only be awarded to a graduate who, in addition to achieving first class honors, displays ability which is considered to be outstanding by the University Medals Committee. It is my particular pleasure to present to you Carol Jennifer Reindler with honors and University Medalist. Chancellor, I present to you a candidate who has satisfied requirements for the award of the Graduate Diploma in Epidemiology in the Specialization of Clinical Epidemiology, Alicia Jacqueline Kell. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of the Graduate Diploma in Health Science in the Specialization of Clinical Drug Dependent Studies. Dale Allen. <laughs> Stephen Allen. <laughs> Tracy Ann Brown. Janelle Crawley. <laughs> Stephen Paul Sims. <laughs> Marcel Lucette Williams. Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of the Graduate Diploma in Health Science in the Specialization of Primary Health Care. Deborah Ann Bailey. <laughs> K. Robin Copper. Paula Louise Fairhurst. <laughs> Patricia Joy Hines. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of the graduate diploma in Health Services Management, Raymond Howe. <laughs> Dr. 
Daphne Jill Streha. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of the Graduate Diploma in Health Social Sciences in the specialization of health promotion. Erica Lynn James. Maria Jane Reese. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied requirements for the award of the Graduate Diploma in Occupational Health and Safety. Rosalyn Ann Avery. Pauline Collar. Rodney Michael Rosenfeld. Nicole Williams. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Applied Science in the Specialization of Consumer Science with Honors, Class II, Division II, Jennifer Newton. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Health Services Management, Doreen Anderson. James William Cartwright. <laughs> Wayne Jeffrey Clark. <laughs> Brian Francis Dunn. Mark Anthony Orr. <laughs> Kerry Lee Stevenson. <laughs> Chu Hong Agnes Tam. Saranuj Tomonshak. <laughs> Kwai Sim Juliana Isa Yu. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of the coursework diplomates and graduates of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. I call on the Pro Vice Chancellor, Research and Information Technology to present research, master and doctor of philosophy degree candidates. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of uh, Medical Science in the specialization of clinical epidemiology. I present to you Betty Morrison Tawaki, who holds, a who holds a Diploma of Surgical Medicine from the Fiji School of Medicine. Dr. Tawaki's thesis is on musculoskeletal problems in urban type 2 diabetes in Fiji. <laughs> Chancellor. The degree of Doctor of Philosophy is awarded to a graduate who has successfully completed a prescribed program of study, principally of research. A thesis embodying the outcomes of the research is the principal basis of examination. The degree is only awarded if the thesis makes a significant and original contribution to knowledge and understanding 
of the field of knowledge with which it is concerned. Today, the University is proud to honour Doctor of Philosophy graduates who have satisfied these rigorous criteria for the award of the degree. Chancellor, I present to you Gian Shen, Master of, Master of Science from this University. Dr Shen's thesis is entitled T-Cell Mediated Immune Responses Against Human Melanoma Cells. The work described in this thesis was to evaluate specific ele elements of T-cell reactivity in patients with melanoma. These included characterization of melanoma-specific T-cells and study of factors elaborated by melanoma cells which may influence the induction and development of the T-cells. The focus of this investigation has been to understand how the T-cells from patients with melanoma register tumour antigens. Chancellor, I present to you Carla, Carla Justine Trelaw, Bachelor of Science from this university. Dr Trelaw's thesis is entitled, An Academic Detailing Education Program Aimed at Decreasing Exposure to HIV Infection Amongst Healthcare Workers. This thesis evaluated an education program to reduce the incidence of accidents which expose healthcare workers to the risk of acquiring AIDS, HIV and other viruses. The unique aspect of this project was the move away from the traditional assumptions about these accidents to incorporating innovative ideas and techniques in the education program. You know the doctor right over the other yeah. Chancellor, the degree of Doctor of Medicine is awarded to a candidate who has been engaged in medical or scientific research relevant to the practice of medicine for a substantial period of time. Examination for the degree is based on a selection of published works describing aspects of the study carried out by the candidate as well as a discourse. The degree is only awarded to a candidate whose work represents an original con contribution of distinguished merit in an era of knowledge which is relevant to the practice of medicine. Today, the university is proud to honour a Doctor of Medicine graduate who has made such a contribution. I present to you James Edwin Wright, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery from the University of Sydney. Dr Wright's discourse is entitled, Clinical Studies and Outcome Audit in Surgical Practice. This work consists of a collection of scientific papers published in medical journals whilst in clinical surgical practice, both hospital and private. The subject matter is diverse, but the theme is surgical outcome audit, concerned with the results of surgical treatment and quality assurance as applied to clinical and operative surgery. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of the research masters and doctoral degree graduates. We will now have a, uh, a musical interlude presented by the University Choir and conducted by Father Peter Brock.
I now call upon the Vice-Chancellor to present a member of the staff of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences for an award for excellence in teaching. Chancellor, the University's Awards for Excellence in Teaching scheme was established in 1993 to give prominence to the importance of high quality teaching in the University and to reward and encourage excellence. For 1995, the Teaching Committee has selected two submissions which propose innovative teaching approaches or methodologies designed to stimulate students' curiosity and understanding of the subject matter. Chancellor, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Professor Nikolai Bogduk as a recipient for a 1995 Award for Excellence in Teaching. There is a commonly held view that research and teaching are competing activities and that academic staff must make a choice between excelling in one at the expense of the other. Professor Bogduk, a researcher of international standing, has demonstrated that this is not so and that there is a critical synergistic relationship between research and teaching. In order to make his subject anatomy, Interesting to stimulate inquiry, Professor Bogduk uses dramatic presentations which enhance the traditional lecture and small group tutorial. In doing so, Professor Bogduk has sought to demonstrate that anatomy can be worked out rather than simply learnt by rote and has sought in his words to transform the subject from a boring subject to an engaging puzzle.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are particularly fortunate to have with us Mrs. Elaine Henry, Executive Director of the New South Wales Cancer Council. Her work began in Great Britain, involved in particular in the first definition of the damaging effect of smoking upon health and the use of mass communications in public education to do with health promotion. Most of her professional life has been committed to health promotion and preventative health care and she has been Executive Director of the New South Wales Cancer Council for the past 10 years. The University is extremely pleased to extend a warm welcome to Mrs Henry. I now call on Mrs Henry to deliver the occasional address. <laughs> Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, Dean, Faculty, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, but most particularly the graduates and diplomats of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences here at the University of Newcastle. Today, you can sit back and savour the moment. You most definitely deserve it. You might even reflect on the last couple of years, the highs and the lows. But it's tomorrow, the future, for which your education and your training have been preparing you. You've studied many and varied subjects here. And I was going to say you were lucky to have chosen Newcastle, but I'm sure it was design, not luck, that saw you come to Newcastle. I think you probably subscribe, therefore, to the line that I subscribe to, that university studies prepare your mind for what you don't know and extends your capabilities for searching out solutions for the challenges that will be thrown up tomorrow. And you may ask, why is this important? Well, your tomorrow is going to be exciting and it's going to be full of change. And you might retort, the future is always about change. But in today's world, it is the pace of change that is accelerating and in health in particular, it's evident that we need radical change. And I'm sure that if David Madison were here today, he might have said it was evident in the 1970s. Quite simply, our resources are finite. And we've reached a point where demand has outstretched the supply. From my particular perspective, it has come at a time when through research we're acquiring new knowledge from molecular genetics. And this, ladies and gentlemen, threatens to disrupt the very fabric of our society if we start to apply such knowledge in an unplanned way. Now, to plan, we need some vision. And there are those amongst us who will say they don't believe in vision. In fact, if he was quoted correctly, our former premier was amongst these. And indeed, there's some sympathy for this if you look at the worldly changes that have been progressing over the last few years. The breakup of the USSR, the democratization of South Africa, the reunification of Germany, peace in Northern Ireland, the opening up of China. But closer to home, the AIDS epidemic. There was a time not so long ago that that word referred to nursing support personnel. People were in the main unprepared and it was sudden and dramatic changes. And now we're seeing a backlash, initially covert, but increasingly overt. And it's because the whole social fabric was dismantled in the process and nothing put it in, in its place. So we have nations of bewildered people. So we must cha approach change wisely. And I remind you of the words of George Bernard Shaw, that it's not the recollection of the past, but our responsibility for the future that makes us wise. So what is our responsibility for the future? In Australia, as in other developed nations over the past decade, there's been a quiet revolution taking place in health, triggered to some extent by the emergence of the new public health, but going through to traditional medicine and care. And health, of course, is not an island, so it's paralleling changes 
happening in our society, but also bounded by them. And an illustration to clarify that last point. We have ha known how to cure syphilis for the last 50 years, but the disease has not been eradicated. And the language we speak today is full of words like outcomes, best practice, cost effectiveness, patient participation in decision making, disease prevention, health promotion, continuity or seamless care, and I could go on and on and on. Well may you ask what is so revolutionary about health professionals who are involved in the care of a particular patient getting together before treatment is initiated, agreeing the outcome that is desired, putting the patient to the patient the various treatment options based on available evidence, in line with protocols incorporating best practice, which one would assume to be efficient and effective, that is, doing the right thing in the right way, and assisting the patient through the provision of pertinent information skilled communication to decide which is most likely not to disturb his or her quality of life. And once outside the door of the hospital, not to be abandoned, but to continue to be cared for in the community by services, by general practitioners who know what has gone on before and will have the same ethical and philosophical background. And then at the time, the patient, now being cognizant of the causes of his or her disease, opts for reducing the risk factors, which might lead to recurrence, and embraces the notion that prevention is better than cure. Supported, I might say, by an environment in which, say, fiscal measures, as in the budget on Tuesday, make that choice easy. Is this utopia or current practice? The concepts are certainly not revolutionary. It is the way we put them into practice, which requires a vol fast or just plain common sense. And I suspect that depends to a large extent on your alma mater. And it's not an individual, but an integrated response which is called for. And we must get on with building partnerships in health and adding value each step of the way. My own organisation has been going through a quiet revolution over the last decade. It has been building partnerships and using innovation to bring about change. One such partnership has been with your own faculty. In fact, it started when Emeritus Professor Geoffrey Kellerman was appointed to the board of the Cancer Council in 1982. He has acted as our honorary research advisor and since 1986 has been helping us to redefine our role, prepare us for the 21st century, and to ensure we optimise the community's financial investment in cancer research in this state. His wisdom has been invaluable to me, as I'm sure it has been to many of you. The partnership solidified as prevention of ill health assumed greater importance and became even more sophisticated. By the 1980s, it was no longer ethical to make public pronouncements on what an individual should or should not do to maintain his or her health without the necessary research evidence to back it up. Indeed, it's obvious that the public does not want to know what to eat this year, only to be told the reverse next year. And since the proclamation of the Ottawa Charter in the mid-1980s, it's been accepted the public health message based on population statistics but affecting an individual can only be delivered once a supportive environment is put in place to assist those individuals to act on the messages. There is little point in informing the public about the ill effects of smoking, for example, if they are then continually bombarded on the television or when they open their newspapers or indeed watch their favourite support by smoking propaganda. It's also recognised that finite health resources mean that we have to know the best way to deliver preventive health programs, which contain costs whilst deriving the most benefit, and what are the barriers to effective action. Your Professor of Behavioural Science in relation to medicine is not only the Director of Health Advancement here in the Hunter, but since 1988 he has been the Director of the Cancer Council's Cancer Education Research Programs and we've been doing some innovative work. 
His research and his team's research drives our community programs. CHIRP has also allowed the Cancer Council to play a major role in the implementation of the mammographic screening program in Australia. And through innovation, we have been teaching communication skills to the members of many colleges, such as the surgeons, obstetricians and gynaecologists. Now, CHIRP's first five-year report from international reviewers was excellent. His, the team has just been through a midterm review and I have to say that I was delighted to see that it acknowledged the preeminence in behavioural research in Australia of the CHIRP team. Their innovative development work both in utilising emerging, emerging technology and community participation in cancer prevention strategies through its CART or Cancer Action in Rural Towns was particularly applauded. But another way in which, this, in which this partnership has created benefit for the community has been with the secondment of Dr. Sally Redman from the Discipline of Behavioural Science to our organisation. The Council's responsible for coordinating and managing the major cancer screening programs in New South Wales, mammographic screening for the early detection of breast cancer and the organised approach to the prevention of cervical cancer through the PAP test. These are programs that have a budget this year of $25 million. Sally brought her research expertise to the Cancer Council as manager of the Cancer Screening Unit. And over the little time she's been with us, she has gained additional skills in managing large programs that required a separate infrastructure, a different way of working, and of course, controlling budgets. Now this prototype of collaborative arrangement was sufficiently successful to ensure its continuance, but an amazing thing happened. And I think it's propelled Sally onto what is arguably a more exciting future. As a result of the New South Wales Cancer Council's bid, we are now responsible for managing Australia's first national cancer organisation, the National Breast Cancer Centre, and uh, Sally has been conferred its director. So, graduates and diplomats of this august faculty, an algorithm for change is to be wise, to activate, activate the right partnerships, then be prepared to innovate, and you have the ingredients for a very exciting career. There'll be opposition. Many people prefer the status quo. So I think what we need in health is a little more thrust. And is there a mechanism for accelerating change? Clement Beesold, who is a political scientist and a futurist, believes we need a compelling vision, and he defines that as something that establishes a creative tension between what currently exists and what is desired. The Cancer Council knows through our CHIRP surveys that individuals and patients have enormous hunger for information. And attempting to satisfy this need can provide us with the right construct for change. You'll all groan when I mention the superhighway, the information superhighway, so I won't do that. But I will say that once the general information infrastructure for interactive telecommunications via fibre optic cables and satellites are in place, we in health should be set to take advantage of the powerful advances which, which can ensure. To date, the interface between the general public and health information has been an undeveloped resource. But in the not too distant future, we can distribute health information and health decision-making tools directly to the public. And if we are wise, we can simultaneously address the needs of consumers more effectively while solving the many problems of the healthcare system. Health-oriented interactive te telecommunications will merge the capabilities of television, personal computers, and the telephone. Such systems or servers of information will be user-friendly, whether you're a consumer or a healthcare professional. They can operate at, for users at different levels of knowledge, and they can be fully integrated in the home or workplace. Moreover, such systems can both motivate and increase an individual's competence in assuming greater self-responsibility for health. And you'll hear in the coming months about 
self-care replacing health care. And these will be further advanced if we capitalise on the growing recognition of the value of prevention. A triage system would operate and those that can use self-help will do so, so that those that need health care will get more quality care. I guess you've heard all this somewhere before. Is it all pie in the sky, you might ask? Well, Australia, of course, has been quick to use the convergence of tele telecommunications and computers. Do you remember the days when we didn't have facsimiles or the cellular telephone? And I think we already have seen that integrated services digital network has numerous applications, as you'll be aware, in the healthcare sector if we just exploit it for remote medical consultation and the transmission of things like digital x-rays. For me, it's not too difficult to envisage that the year 2000 will deliver more than the Sydney Olympics. And in America, they have this vision of pixels, which are public information communication systems and electronic libraries. And they believe we can use this to convert the community's underutilised personal resources into an active medical democracy. Now, I, it's an exciting future. I could go on about technology, but I won't. But of course, as I said, we need wisdom, not more information, if we're going to obtain a positive result. And in saying this, I'm reminded of the words of Julie Birchall, who is a correspondent with the Sunday Times in London. And she has said, it is one of the great cruel certainties of modern life that an idea conceived by middle class professionals in the belief that its application to society as a whole will make it a happier place invariably makes the lives of most people far, far worse. So we should keep in mind that things can go terribly wrong if we add indiscriminately knowledge that we gain from the Human Genome Project, for instance. We're moving from a diagnose and treat past into a predict and manage future. We are not only able to predict primary disease in which subpopulations will be susceptible susceptible at some time of their life cycle. Through epidemiology, we can do this at the macro level now. But molecular genetics will deliver an understanding of our individual predisposition to disease at the, macro, at the micro level. Now, the prospect of finding out at a young age that you have a predisposition to develop a disease later in life with, with no proven intervention, except perhaps radical surgery is rather daunting. It throws up ethical and legal implications, threatens societal norms in terms of employment, insurance, and relationships in particular. And society has not shown any proclivity to date to sort through these issues. Indeed, few groups around the world have sought to grapple with the needs of society. There's been a great reluctance to even set priorities in healthcare, as you would no doubt be aware. The Oregon experience is our best attempt to date. Many groups were happy to be judgmental, but did not necessarily want to actively participate and plan for the future. Those in Oregon know what it is to be a pioneer, and it's not easy. David Madison and the founding faculty here must have discovered this your current faculty too, in persevering with supporting an integrated environment of medicine and health sciences from which you as graduates will benefit in the future. However, Dean, you may, must take great satisfaction from knowing that the innovative changes here at Newcastle have been paid the greatest compliment by being emulated by other medical faculties. Congratulations. Graduates, and diplomats, go wisely because our future is in your hands. Mrs. Henry, thank you very much for that address. You describe uh, an exciting, I suppose, brave new world. Fast pace of change and a need and a hunger, if you like, for leadership, particularly in the field of healthcare. And I'm sure that today we have a number of candidates for that brave future, 
and a leading role in it. Thank you very much indeed. I now have great pleasure in inviting Ms. Karen Height to speak on behalf of the graduates. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, honoured guests, friends and fellow graduates and diplomats. The graduation ceremony presently underway symbolises a number of things for all of us here today. First and foremost, this ceremony symbolises formal recognition of the academic achievement of all graduates present today. The conferring of our respective degrees, diplomas and doctorates represents the attainment of a number of rewards. These include a licence with which to gain employment in our chosen fields, avenues through which to escape our study and obtain long-awaited real money, opportunities to travel, a stepping stone to further study, the initiation of a lifelong career or a springboard into another. It is the end product of years of study, discipline and hard work worthy of recognition and celebration. Our presence here today also symbolises the support and opportunities provided by the University of Newcastle. We've been fortunate to have experienced a number of interesting dimensions within our respective programs. During our studies, we have experienced the value of problem-based and self-directed learning, urging us to become more holistic and independent in our thinking. We have experienced and appreciated links between the University of Newcastle and major non-government organisations, such as the New South Wales Cancer Council. During our formal studies and clinical placements, we have gained experience and knowledge in a number of diverse areas, such as community health, health promotion, rural health, and local and global health issues. Indeed, the high quality of the programs provided by the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences is illustrated by the fact that programs are now being utilised by other and sometimes older academic institutions, thus providing examples for other centres of learning to follow. In, in addition to encouraging academic development, university life also provided opportunities to develop and identify our own potential on a personal level. We have enjoyed a myriad of social experiences, such as the O-balls, beach parties and Thursday nights at the Bar on the Hill membership of any number of sports clubs, utilisation of recreational facilities, the opportunity to participate in activities arranged through religious, artistic and political groups. The presence of these avenues has promoted our development as well-balanced individuals and heightened our awareness of the diversity and richness present within our university life. Through the promotion of academic and personal development, our university experiences have assisted in equipping us with the personal and professional skills required to meet the challenges of the present healthcare system and to advance within our chosen professions. Today also symbolises the graduation of some of the first students to have experienced the merging of the health sciences and medicine to become the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. This merger has represented a major change in the structure of this university during the course of our studies, but represents an avenue with great potential. That is, for closer liaison between students of medicine and health-related professions, and an increased understanding of and respect for various professional roles. If carried forth into the workplace, these aspects will facilitate increased cohesion between those working within the healthcare system and the provision of a truly holistic health service for consumers or clients. I firmly believe that these avenues will develop and in turn further assist the professional development of students in the near future. Today also provides an opportunity to formally acknowledge and thank all those who have shared our journey through university and who now fill the auditorium. To our families, our friends and our educators, thank you for the guidance, advice, enthusiasm and support you have all provided in assisting us to this point in our lives. Today you share in our celebration. For all graduates, today's ceremony symbolises a celebration of the end of one part of our life's journey and entry into another. Savour today 
and reap the rewards that will follow from the work that each of us has invested in achieving our positions here today. Let us cherish the past, embrace the present and welcome the future. I would like to thank Ms Hyde for her speech. She's obviously a willing participant for the pace of change and the exciting future that we've heard about this morning. I now declare this ceremony concluded and invite all present to join us for refreshments which will be served in and provided by the University Union.